Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2018 webinar series. Tonight's we webinar is on selling to retail grocers and restaurants in Idaho. I'm Colette DePhelps. I'll be your presenter tonight. I'm a community food systems area educator with the University of Idaho Extension, located in Moscow, Idaho. And Marcy Miller, who is the Education Director for Rural Roots, is going to be our question and answer moderator tonight. Marcy's also co-owner of Deep Roots Farm in Moscow, and they sell to both a retail grocer and to restaurants. So I might ask her to jump in and share her perspective throughout the webinar. If you're new to being on a webinar, a couple of tips. Please close all the other programs running on your computer. That's going to help with the quality of the program for you, both in terms of clarity and speed. If you're having problems with your sound, you can call in on the telephone to listen to the webinar. So if you want to do that, use the call-in number that was provided in your welcome email and mute your computer when you're using the phone so you don't get feedback. There's a question box in the type, the side panel of your webinar on your screen. It should be on your right hand side. You can type questions into that box anytime throughout the webinar. And as I said, there will be different points in the webinar that I'll stop and I'll answer questions. Also, so there are three handouts available for tonight's webinar. You can download those anytime throughout the program. One is all of the slides that I'm showing you. I also have one that is um, the results of some interviews that I'm going to talk about and also some with some survey data that I'm going to talk about. If you have any trouble downloading those handouts, I'd be happy to email them to you. And at the end of this slideshow, you'll be able to see my email. The focus of tonight's email is really going to be what does it take to be successful in a retail market? And when we're talking about retail markets, we're often talking about retail grocery stores, be that a conventional grocery store, a food co-op, a small natural food store, or a large natural food store. We're also talking about restaurants and sometimes institutions. Tonight, I'm going to focus specifically on retail grocers and restaurants. So really, there's a couple of questions that you need to ask yourself and to ask your market to find out whether or not you can be successful in retail markets. One is, are you producing products that they want? Another is, can you sell them at a price that they will pay and still make money? And this is a pretty key component for selling into a retail market, and we'll talk more about that tonight. And then, how do you find out? So to start, I want to do a, a little bit of a poll to better understand who is in our audience tonight. So for this first poll, can you tell us whether you're a farmer or a rancher, perhaps you're a restaurant owner or buyer, a retail grocer or an employee, or if you're an educator, faculty, perhaps a student? So about 67% of our participants have voted. I'll give it a few more seconds for people to go on. 75%, over 80%. Okay, last chance to vote before I close the poll. Great. So here are the results. About 64% of the people on tonight are farmers and ranchers. Another 18% are educators or university faculty and students, and then 18% others. So thank you for that. Now I have another poll. If you could tell us where you're located. See where in Idaho you're located or if you're outside of Idaho. Okay. 
about two thirds of our participants have voted so far. Just give it a couple more seconds. Okay, I'll close the poll and share the results. So a little over half of our participants are in North Idaho, about not quite 10% in Southwest Idaho, 18% in Southeast Idaho, nine in Central Idaho, and 9% outside of Idaho. So for those of you that are outside Idaho, I think that the results are still going to be relevant to you, but I'm going to show you a lot of information that is very Idaho specific. So I want us to start by saying to be successful, it's really important to know who your customer are, is. And in retail markets, your customer is going to be different than your customer is going to be in a direct market. So when I talk about direct markets, I'm talking about selling direct to the consumer, and that might be through a farmer's market, a CSA share, a farm stand, or any other place that you're selling directly to the person who's going to consume, consume the food. When you're selling into a retail market to a grocer or a restaurant, or even if it's direct to an institution like a hospital or food service at a college, we call that intermediated markets. And those markets are going to have perhaps the same or different values than you do, which drive their local purchasing. But they're going to have very di different needs that affect whether or not they purchase your product than you're going to see within a direct market. So we're going to talk about those values and needs tonight. We're also going to talk about best practices for selling into these different kinds of markets and how you might research and assess your market. So to start out, I wanted to talk a little bit about researching your market and two different kinds of data that we use to better understand our market. One is called primary data, and that's data that you collect yourself by phoning or visiting or surveying your target audience. So you might have a questionnaire that you take around to different restaurants that you're interested in selling to, and you schedule interviews and talk to the buyer. Or you might talk to other growers in your area about what their experience is. You might talk to different um, consumers within a produce department about what they're interested in in terms of local produce. It's your direct interaction with the segment of your market that you're interested in learning more about. That's the primary data. Secondary data is research data that's already been collected that you use to understand that audience. And that that information informs your research. So it can't replace your primary research because your, your primary research is very specific to your locale, but it can inform it and help you identify what questions that you want to ask. What I'm going to share with you tonight is a lot of market research that I have done with some of my colleagues at the University of Idaho over the last several years looking at how can we increase the sales from small farms across Idaho to specifically retail grocers and restaurants? So this is secondary research for you. It might be more relevant to you because you're in Idaho and it's from Idaho. Hopefully we've done an analysis in a way that will be helpful to you. But really what it's going to do is inform your primary research. So what we did is we did in-depth interviews across the state of Idaho with small farmers, distributors, both large distributors and cooperatively owned distributor, distributors that are owned by farmers or farmers and workers that are selling within the state of Idaho. We talked to restaurants and we talked to retail grocers. And what we asked them are, what were the opportunities and challenges they saw for selling into restaurants and retail grocers in Idaho? So when we talked to producers, some of the opportunities they saw was that there really is a strong demand for local and regional products, and there's a strong demand for some specialty items. 
a lot of producers felt that these markets were uh, nice because they could meet the demands of fewer customers. So they could get to know their buyers at the restaurant or in retail and really understand what they needed and grow for those needs. Also, they were larger accounts. People were generally speaking, but not all the time, willing to buy more. And if they had larger accounts, so they were selling more to specific outlets, they saw that that might entail less time and travel for marketing or time for marketing marketing and time for travel. And they said this ex was especially the case when they were selling through a distributor, primarily the farmer cooperative distributors like Link Foods in Spokane and Idaho's Bounty in the Boise area because that distributor would pick up from an area that was much closer to the market and deliver perhaps to multiple customers for them. And they felt that they were able to capture an economy of scale in production. So if they were producing more and they were doing that very efficiently, that they might be able to get at um, a price point that was a little bit lower and that price point was more amenable to these particular um, buyers. Some of the challenges is that many producers felt like the wholesale prices were too low to meet what they needed to have for profitability, both when selling through a distributor or selling direct to the restaurant or retailer. In terms of supply, sometimes they were having a hard time meeting the quality, particularly no understanding the grading that different buyers needed to have within retail grocers. Maybe they were having challenges maintaining the cold chain from harvest through delivery. And a number said that it was really hard to produce the quantity of product that grocers wanted and also restaurants, but particularly grocers. Sometimes it was difficult to understand the package requirements of retailers or those packages were quite expensive. They weren't quite sure how to connect with buyers and establish relationships. And then there was a dependence on other producers. And this was particularly when people were using a cooperative distributor. In that situation, if other producers didn't follow through on what their orders were, then it could essentially result in a situation where the buyers were losing faith in the distributor. It was also a challenge if they were going, trying to enter into a market where one of the buyers had had a bad experience in terms of buying from a different local producer. So then they might not feel very confident in buying from a new producer. Our interviews really informed a lot of questions that we asked in an email survey that we've did in the fall of 2015 and winter of 2016. And we had 73 producers across Idaho answer our survey. And this survey was particularly about their experience selling to restaurants and retail in the state of Idaho. On this map, the green circles are the locations of the producers that we heard from. Each dot does not necessarily represent one producer, it's a zip code locator. So there could have been more than one producer in that particular area, but you get the general distribution of where the producers were. And in another slide, I'll go more into detail on this map about the, the buyer respondents. So the producers that we heard from in the survey, so number of years farming, 40% of them were farming more than 20 years. And and another almost 20 percent, uh, 10 to 20 years. So that means that about 60 percent of our respondents had a lot of experience farming and what we were considered, what we consider to be experienced farmers. And even our farmers with less experience, most of them had been farming three to 10 years. Their sales, they were generally smaller producers, so they had sales of $80,000 or less, with most of the producers having sales between um, less, less than $30,000.
of the producers that we heard from, 86% were interested in increasing the quantity and variety of products that they sold to local restaurants and retailers. And almost 50% of them were already selling to restaurants and another 40% to food co-ops or some type of cooperative grocery store. We asked for a lot of information about sales outlets. These are the top five if they are not all that we asked for. So some of these producers that responded were also selling to conventional retail. So as you can see from this slide, most were doing direct markets, like on-site farm stand, you pick farmer's markets, or direct through the internet or an online market. And then we had quite a few with experience with restaurants and retailers. The producers, that we heard from identified six top challenges to selling into restaurant and retail markets. One of them was quantity, which is what, what we also heard in our interviews. They also felt that the market was not predictable and not very dependable. And with this question, we were asking about whether or not they felt that that was a really reliable market. And in our interviews, a number of people talked about how they weren't sure from week to week how much product a restaurant or a grocer was going to buy. They also felt that they had inadequate knowledge of restaurant or retailers purchasing practices. So they didn't have enough knowledge to really be effective at accessing these markets. They couldn't supply products year round, and that was something the markets really valued. They didn't have enough time for marketing. And for those that were really rural, they didn't have an efficient or affordable distribution system for small and medium farms. So with this, I wanted to stop and see if there's any questions, Marcy, or if you have any comments that you wanted to make about the perspectives that I've shared so far from producers or about selling into these restaurants. Yeah, I don't see any questions, but I think one of the things that we learned um, and it's taken several years to learn is really building those relationships and continuing to have conversations with those people who are buying produce from farmers directly. Um, they all have their unique set of um, expectations um, between the food co-ops and the restaurants. How we connect with them um, can be so different, but it really is that relationship building um, and really figuring out over time what that, what that looks like. And I think going back to one of your earlier slides as well, um, of really knowing what your costs are in production to know what you can sell things for. So we don't take all of our items to try to sell them to these um, retail markets because we've, we've looked at the numbers and we've looked at our budgets and can really recognize um, what we can sell things for and not everything lends itself to selling retail. Um, so that's definitely one thing to be aware of is not everything that you grow is going to be suitable for those retail outlets. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, let's take a look at what the retail grocers said in the interviews that we had. So some of the opportunities that retail grocers saw is that their customers do want to buy local produce and dairy and meats and value added products. So across the board in terms of food and farm products, customers are interested. They felt that they could really manage in season specials and that there was a strong market demand for things that were not only local but also sustainable. They were also really interested in working with with local and regional distributors to purchase local products because they felt that that was going to be a lot more efficient for them in in time and it fit within their existing ordering protocols. Some of the challenges that they faced was the seasonality of produce which is why the in-season specials were something that they focused on being able to manage and sometimes they felt that quality was an issue with products coming in that it didn't meet their standards. And one of those things with quality was the variability 
of like the size of the produce. So for specific things, as you can see here in this asparagus picture, they're looking for putting together a unit for sale that is pretty standard across units. And if you think about looking keen at produce within the grocery store that if you have heads of lettuce they're all the same size they're generally selling a lot of things by each so packaging needs to be at a certain size and that was something what their bunches were their preferred sides were were something that growers didn't know and quantity was challenging they needed a larger quantity often than produce could supply. It took a lot of time for them to work with multiple producers and distributors and many of them said that that was a cost to them and that was because it took more staff time and while they were really excited about local produce they needed to figure out ways for that to be a really efficient time efficient relationship. Price often producers and co-op distributor prices were too high to meet their price points and what the producer or the grocers also told us is that depending on the community, they could ask for a higher or lower price. So in some communities, like in central Boise, the consumer would bear a higher price than they would in an outlying community like Caldwell. Also, local ordering and delivering systems and processes often were not convenient and this might be an individual getting um, communicating with an individual that was selling and then delivering that product and the times those products were delivered and the relationships of getting the invoices and paperwork they needed could be a challenge. Also, sometimes it was inconvenient to go into an online system and try to order there and understand how that system worked and whether or not they would get a, the quantity that they needed. With restaurants, there were some different opportunities. Again, customers wanted local, but also customers from restaurants, they really valued the farm identity. And so it was important to restaurants to be able to have a relationship with the particular farm that they were getting their produce from. So even if they were selling or buying through a distributor, like the farmer cooperative distributors I mentioned, they still wanted to know what particular farm each product came from so that they could identify that within their restaurant. They felt that they had opportunities to use smaller quantities of products for specials or specific menu items. They really valued the personal relationships with producers, which is something that Marcy just spoke to. And they felt that they could be flexible when errors did occur in the orders and product sizes or volumes might vary. And particularly with the product size, because most often they were going to be putting that into a dish they were making, they could deal with that variability. Their challenges, very similar in quantity and sometimes quality, so very similar to the retail grocers. They, some of them said that working with a lot of producers takes a lot of time, as with the retail grocers, that was an expense that they needed to factor in when buying locally. They also said that some producers were just not easy to work with. Uh, price, again, producer and co-op distributor prices were often too high. And then a couple of the restaurants talked about it was hard to count on enough quantity for their regular menu items. And because of that, their financial risk was greater. So for instance, there was a restaurant that we talked to and one of their signature salads was a romaine salad. And they felt that it was super important that they always were able to get romaine lettuce and they weren't sure if they were going to be able to get the quantity that they wanted or the consistency through the season from local producers. So that was an item that they decided that they would get through their regular distributor but they would look at other types of greens that they could be um, using in salad specials or in their leaf lettuce salads because that didn't need to be um, as regular in terms of supply and they could supplement that from their distributor. 
Another restaurant that we talked about said that they had a challenge because when they bought spinach, they would buy spinach from multiple producers and the spinach would look different. It would be different sized or it would have a different texture because it was a different variety. And so if they were, were expecting to get one kind of variety of spinach and they got another, it kind of threw them for a loop in terms of whatever their menu items were. Again, we used the information that we got from the interviews to do a survey of restaurant and retail buyers, retail grocery buyers across the state of Idaho. And here's this map again that I showed you when we talked about the producers. We also um, heard from buyers and we heard from them all across, from all across Idaho. But when we were looking at the locations of the buyer respondents, we recognized that about half of our respondents came from counties that already had a pretty visible local food scene developed and those counties are in this map in, on this map in blue and they're Bonner County where Sandpoint is, Kootenai County where Coeur d'Alene is, Lataw County which is where Moscow is, Ada County which is Boise, the Treasure Valley area and Blaine County which is the Sun Valley area and then we recognized that we had quite a few responses from Idaho counties that had a less visible local food scene so some of the data that I'm going to show you today is going to be divided out by those different buyer types, whether they're in a county that already has a visible local food scene or a less visible county. Some of the data I'll show you is also together, but is spread out in one of the handouts that you got. And what we really wanted to learn is were there any significant differences that people might want to pay attention to based on the different counties that they're located in and whether or not there's always already an established local food market. So when you're looking at secondary data it is important to understand and who was asked questions and you know when I was talking about the producer survey I showed you, you know, the age, you know, the length of farming that the different producers had done and what their income was, where they were around the state, so you could kind of get a feel for where their responses might be coming from, what their different markets were, level of experience with restaurant markets and retail grocers. And it's important to also understand that in terms of the information I'm going to show you for the restaurant and retail buyers. And when we put our survey together, we really tried to glean the literature to find out who was out there that was buying local already, make sure that we sent them an invitation to take our survey. And then we also bought some contact information from Info USA, which has business contact information across the state of Idaho. So we call this a convenient sample because nowhere is there a list of people that are already buying local or are interested in buying local in terms of the restaurant and retail buyers. So who, who completed our survey? So as you can see, we divided the data in this picture between those visible counties I talked about and the less visible counties. So we had 22 restaurants that were in the visible counties, 22 restaurants in the less visible counties. And then when we looked at the retail grocers, we divided them out to look at how many were non-conventional, which means they were natural food co-ops or natural food stores, and how many were conventional, which is your, your more general grocery store. So you might think of that as an Albertsons. And they self-identify whether they were non-conventional or conventional within the survey. So we had more non-conventional buyers within the visible counties and a few more conventional buyers in the less visible counties. But as you can see, we had a mix of both. So the buyers that we heard from though, whether they were in a visible county or a less visible county, were buyers that were already purchasing local food. And so when we talk about the opportunities and the challenges from the survey, 
survey data, it's nice to know that these are people by and large that are not guessing about what their challenges would be or what their interests and motivations are. They're people that are doing it. So that's really important for you to know as a grower that is considering using this data and applying it to some of your decision making and your other market research. So as you can see, 97% of our respondents in the and that were in the visible counties and 93% in the less visible counties were already purchasing local food. So let's do another poll. So what percent do you think of the buyers that we surveyed wanted to increase the quantity of local products that they purchase? So I gave you some broad categories here. So what percentage do you think? So, right, 87%, 93%. Okay, I'm gonna show you the results. Here's your results. Okay, so about 20% thought that, you know, 80% 80, 80 to 100 of the buyers wanted to increase the quantity of local food. Another almost 36% of you said, well, the next year, probably 61 to 80%. A third of you thought 41 to 60% and 14%, 21 to 40%. But most of you felt that they probably, at least some percentage, wanted to increase more. So one more poll about what you think buyers said, and then I'll show you the data. What percent do you think wanted to increase the variety of local products that they purchase? So thinking about the diversity. Three quarters of our participants have voted. Let's give it a couple more seconds. Okay, I'll give it one more second. I'm gonna close the poll. And I'll share the results. So again, about 20% of our folks on the line today said that they think 80 to 100% would be in, interested in increasing the variety of local products that they purchase. About 36% said 61 to 80% would be interested in increasing the variety. And just under half of you thought it was gonna be more 41 to 60%. So thanks for doing those polls. And now I'll show you the results. So when we look at the quantity of local products that people are interested in increased buying, 94% of respondents in the visible counties said that they wanted to increase the quantity of local products and 92% in the less visible counties said they wanted to increase the quantity. And then in terms of variety, it was 94% of the respondents in the visible counties and 85% in the less visible counties. So most of our respondents were highly interested in increasing quantity and variety, which is pretty exciting in terms of selling into these markets. There is a strong demand. So we asked about motivations because we thought it's really important to understand what motivates people to buy local. And again, with this, the burgundy is visible counties and the gray is less visible counties. So the number one thing in both visible and less visible counties, so from buyers overall, was supporting local producers. That was really important to them. In the more visible counties, you see there's a much stronger emphasis on quality of the product. But overall, quality was important. And then you can see that supporting the local economy is also very important. It's interesting that as you move into the less visible counties, you see things like flavor, 
differentiating themselves in the marketplace, uniqueness of products, and consumer demand going lower. But overall, it's really interesting to see that while in our interviews, we saw that consumer demand was high, that everybody said consumer demand is high for local food, that consumer demand was not something that's, that this particular group of people put as their highest motivations. So what's important to understand about motivations is this really reflects what people value in a lot of ways. And so understanding what would motivate somebody to buy local is a starting point for a conversation. Another thing that we ask buyers is what characteristics were really important to them. There's a lot of labels out there, um, a lot of different um, ways that we communicate how food is grown or some different values around production and what that means in terms of a geographic region and how animals are treated. So I'm sorry, this is out of order uh, because this is going back to local and regional. So I'll just say that overall, people were very interested in both locally grown and regionally grown. We identified local within 100 miles, regional 100 to 400 miles. And it was pretty consistent across county types. But here we are. At characteristics. <laughs> so in terms of characteristics, if you look the darker shaded um, parts of the bars are what was either very important or somewhat important. When you get into these lighter shades over here, that was people were neutral on the very light purple color um, or the medium light purple color and then they thought it was somewhat or very unimportant when you look at, at the lightest color. And for this particular slide, we're looking at the buyer respondents as a group. And I know this slide is really busy, so it is in your handout so that you can look at it in more detail. And in your handout, it is it's divided up by county types because there are some differences with county types. But as you can see from this slide, uh, local and regionally grown are the most important important characteristics. So geography matters. When you look at it locally grown within 100 miles was just rated a little bit higher than regionally grown. So there's demand for both. Um, one thing that we found really interesting is that antibiotic free was very important as was free range in terms of, of livestock. And non-GMO also came up as being really important to this audience. And then when we look at certified organic, which is the very bottom bar, you see that many fewer buyers were thinking that for them certified organic was very important. It was somewhat important to about half the buyers, but not as important overall as having the product be non-genetically modified, which was very important to over half the buyers. So this is a slide that it might be worth taking a little bit of time after the webinar looking at and thinking about um, how this might reflect the buyers that you, you want to talk to or how you might craft questions to find out from your buyers what characteristics are very important to them. I just wanted to show you one slide that showed some of the variability between the visible counties and the less visible counties and encourage you to look at the attached handout so that you can see those differences in more detail. So we looked at this in terms of certified organic and non-GMO. So when you look at the counties with the visible um, local food scenes, you see that certified organic or is um, important to about 16% of the buyers. So that that is a good number of buyers, but a large number of buyers are interested in non-GMO. 
And when you look at the less visible counties, we didn't have any buyers that indicated that certified organic was very important to them, but we still did have a significant amount of buyers who felt that non-GMO was important. But again, you can see that there's a lot of variability between the buyer types, which means it's very an important conversation to have. And particularly in less visible counties, you're going to want to find out, um, you won't want to assume that one production system or another is more valued by your buyer. You would need to go find that out with a specific conversation. So I wanted to pause here and see if you have any questions or comments that you want to share about the past few slides and the outcomes of our surveys. If you have anything that surprises you or ideas about how you would use this information to pre prepare for a conversation with a potential buyer. And Marcy, if you have any comments that you would like to make, that would be great. Um, I think that some of those um, responses are just fascinating, especially looking at how uh, beginning farmers can begin to market their produce or their um, their other products that, that they're growing. Um, I think that's a really important thing to be looking at. Um, and Peter had a question about much of the discussion looks like it's focusing on produce. Um, were the producers you interviewed mostly produce growers or was there a mix? So the producers were a mix. And um, in terms of the products, let me go back up here. So, um, so when we talked to the buyers, we had a mix like here in terms of characteristics that were related to produce and that were also related to meat. So the producers that self-selected were growing a lot of different things. So that was a real diversity of growers in terms of the earlier producer slides. In terms of the questions related to purchasing products, we did ask specific questions about what products people were interested in. And we didn't really have enough of a response rate to show some consistency across those products. We would really need to delve down into the data. But when we look at characteristics, we asked ones that were definitely related to produce, but others that were specifically related to meat, like free range, humane animal treatment, grass fed. The certification for organic could be either, but also like antibiotic free. I hope that's answering his question. Yeah, I think it really is answering the question and, and you know, I think really, you know, using some of these terms and, and really figuring out what they mean, um, you know, what are the definitions of some of them to use in people's marketing, use it on your website, um, but be, you know, be true to what the definition of it is um, when you're using it in your marketing. So there's another question that just popped up. I'm surprised to s that non-GMO seems to be more important than organic grown. Could this be a new trend in terms? Um, it, it could be a new trend. I can't speak to it in terms of this particular data set because we're asking these survey questions at a point in time. But what we've seen overall in local foods over the last 10 years is that it's becoming more and more important to customers, whether that's uh, direct to consumer sales or to specific buyers, because it's important to their customers um, to have a feel a relationship with a farm. And that what we've seen is a shift in into identifying local and farm identity preserved as being very much a priority and having a relationship with a farmer or trusting that the restaurant that you're you know having local food at or the retailer that you're buying from has a relationship with that farmer that that's become more important than a certification and we could hypothesize that some of that might be because there's been controversy around certified organic. But we also are seeing trends across the US in people wanting to engage more in community and 
focusing on relationships and community. So what I what I see is that this trend towards local is very relationship based and identifies that uh, producers, um, it would benefit them to understand that their buyers and the customers of their buyers really want to have a relationship with them and be able to know their farmer and be able to ask questions and to trust the practices of that farmer because they have a personal relationship with them versus relying on something that's more generic. It does have value, but it doesn't touch home and the heart, I don't think, as um, local and identity preserved does. Marcy, what are your thoughts? I think that's absolutely true. And I, you know, want to touch on what Diane Green um, commented on about serving customers to see if, if they care about certification, um, because I think it really does indicate that, especially this data indicates that that regional or locally grown, those relationships are, are so much more important, really knowing your farmer um, and how, how can we as producers really um, extend that that trust and those values that we have through the buyers that that might be selling our produce on shelves um and how do we continue to keep that relationship with those with those buyers um and is it some sort of certification or or do they trust um is that trust enough basically through through the outlets that they're buying from or the restaurants that they're that they're eating at um, but how do we as farmers protect the integrity of what we're doing too? So I think it's, I think it's going to be an ongoing discussion. I think that this is going to change and I think we might see rapid changes in some of these views um, as we move forward too. I, I totally agree, Marcy. And I also think that it's important to understand when you look at the different criteria or these characteristics that we've laid out here that saying that certified organic is not very important does not mean that they don't care about production practices because that's very evidenced in like pesticide free or how animals are raised that's they're showing that it production practices do matter and it would be important for you to understand from the particular buyer that you're working with what things matter to them because most likely they're going to be reflecting to you what matters to the end customer that's going to eat at their restaurant or buy from their grocery store are there any more questions that have come in or should we move on that's all for now okay great So then the big question comes up, why aren't they buying? You know, I have a product that people say that they want, um, they seem motivated, they value local producers, they want to support the local economy, they know it's a better product. But when I actually go out there, I hear things like, this is what farmers say, um, have said to me, uh, they say they want local, but they don't buy much. Or I have great products, and they're better than anything that they could get from a distributor, but they're still not buying very much, or they don't want to pay what my product is worth. And I think these are all things that farmers do experience and that they're valid. But I think what you'll see in the next slides is are some responses from our buyers that might um, illuminate why there isn't as much purchasing happening as we might hope. So when we asked buyers about challenges, one of the significant challenges was price. And we can see this in the service, um, in the survey data, that the majority of respondents said that price was a moderate to significant challenge. And this was echoed in our interviews that we had. The restaurants and the grocers said that they actually operate on pretty slim margins and so they couldn't pay retail or close to retail prices. So while they wanted to buy local, price was a, def a definite factor. And so they needed to make really careful decisions about what they could 
purchase. And also in the case of one retail grocer that I talked to, they said that they could buy things at a higher price, but some of the challenge that they had was selling it within the shelf life of that product because they recognized that they were getting oftentimes products that were varieties and um, and handled or or picked and handled more in alignment for a fresh market than a retail market. So it came to them at the very peak of freshness, but they needed something that held for a longer amount of time within the grocery store. And so those types of things could um, really limit how much they could buy because they had to move it so fast, otherwise they would have spoilage. Another thing that was challenging for them is that the extra time that was required to buy local products cost more money because it costs more staff time. And so for many, it was a moderate challenge, but again, others, you know, 35% said that, that that wasn't their issue. So from our survey data, the top 10 challenges that we saw were often, many of them were actually related to what was available. So pri while price was high, it was a larger challenge that specific products that they wanted weren't available, or they couldn't access when they access the products when they needed them, or the variety that they needed. And part of that they felt was related to the distribution system, and part of that related to not having a large enough quantity available. And that's part of the challenge, particularly in selling to retail grocers, is that they're moving so much product that when they put it on the shelf, they need to know that they're going to be able to meet the demand of meet the demands of their buyer. And so that's why some of them said that seasonal specials were something that worked better for them. So they could get a large enough quantity that they could have a big special, a really nice display. They were buying one product that they could perhaps uh, pay a little bit more money for because it also drew people into the produce section and they would be really excited about those cherries or those really fresh tomatoes or corn on the cob, asparagus. I think we all can think about some of those products. And, and then they would be able to sell more of them. I think that when we, um, another thing that was really desirable was local eggs. So local eggs were in high demand and they could sell pretty much all of the local eggs that came to them and they needed more local eggs. That was one of their challenges. And this challenge information, again, is in one of your handouts so that you can take some time to look at that in more detail. I wanted to talk a little bit about who is your customer. So I've mentioned this a little bit before, but when you're in a retail market, your customer, you actually have two customers that you need to think about. You have your customer, the person that you're selling to and what's motivating them and what they're interested in, what some of the challenges are that you need to work with them to overcome, that they also have a customer that they have to serve. And that customer is probably going to share some of those motivations, but maybe not all. But they're going to have some things that they expect when they are buying things at the grocery store or a restaurant. So at the grocery store, they're going to be expecting some type of uniformity. They're going to expect things that are packaged in sizes or bundled in sizes that you would normally see at a grocery store. Um, definitely farm identity is great, but there's some comparison shopping that's going on in the grocery store, especially if your grocery store has both local and non-local products. And so your products really need to shine within that environment. And when you're selling to a restaurant, they are really looking for that very high quality product that they 
um, that their customers looking for and that it's fresh, that it's, you know, on par or better th than anything that they could get from a distributor. And when you're in a retail environment, you know, thinking about who your competitors are is also important. Because in a large sense, your competitors are not other local growers. Your competitors are folks you have no control over. They're Food Service of America. Grasmic Produce is a um, Southern Idaho uh, family-owned longtime produce distributor. We have Charlie's Produce up in North Idaho or Spokane Produce. And these folks have some systems in place that um, provide a lot of guarantees to retail and restaurant buyers. And it's just something to be mindful of when thinking about why you're not maybe getting the response that you're hoping for from those buyers. They have a relationship with each of these vendors. And if they change that relationship, it might affect, even seasonally, if they change that relationship, if they lower their orders, on a significant number of things, it might put them in a different queue for getting what they really want or the highest quality in the off season. They might also have purchasing agreements that are already in place with distributors that require that they purchase from 70 to 90% of their product through that distributor. And and for that guarantee, they get specific negotiated prices. So there's a lot that can be going on behind the scenes that can be influencing what's happening, particularly at the retail level, but also for restaurants. So it's important to understand that there might already be limited flexibility and that, that that's something that you'll want to talk to your buyer about. You know, how much product could you really buy locally? And it may be that over time they can shift some of those buying and shift some of those contracts. But when you walk in the door, they might have established commitments. And while I, I don't see other local producers necessarily as your direct competitors, if you're moving in and trying to sell to a restaurant that already has a very um, strong set of relationships with local growers, then you, who would probably need to offer something that was unique that they weren't already getting. And you would want to do that because you wouldn't want to be trying to take the, ter you know, the um, market of your neighbor. And so, you know, in having those types of conversations, one great way to approach it would be, is there anything that you really want that you're not able to get from currently from your local vendors? And then you could decide if that's something that you could provide. It may be that, you know, a chef likes a certain breed of animal, but they just really understand that they love Berkshire pork. And so then, and they aren't able to get that locally. So maybe that's something that you can consider whether or not you'd be able to raise a specific breed, or um, maybe there's a specific type of egg that, you know, they have plenty of chicken eggs, but they don't have any quail eggs. So those are the types of things where you might be able to specialize. But it's also really important not to go in and undercut your fellow local producers. And I've heard some real horror stories of that type of thing happening. And it really did backfire against the producers who came in and said, I know XYZ Farm is selling to you and I'll sell to you cheaper. It didn't go over well, but it also really breaks down your community and local food is really based on trust and relationships. And that's also grower to grower. <coughs> In a retail environment, the bottom line really is that you can't compete on price. It's going to be your uniqueness and that's going to be the source of your profitability. It's the one thing that can't be competed away and so as John Eichard says your uniqueness is your only source of profitability that can't be competed away and thus is the only source of sustainable profits. And whether or not you agree with this wholeheartedly what John is really trying to say is that identify your unique uniqueness and have that be 
be your talking point. It's what you can, it's why you can ask for that higher price that you're probably going to need. So before, before I launch into the next few slides, are there any questions or comments? Okay, I don't think there are, so I'll move forward. So this is what we heard from buyers across Idaho on ways that you could increase your sales to them. Um, to increase the quantity and variety of products that you have available that you can offer to them. And that might mean that you're talking to them in advance of planting and growing for your specific market and understanding what kind of, um, what particular varieties are going to work well within that market because it's probably not going to be the same across all retail grocers or across all restaurants. Uh, maintaining quality, which is really making sure that you have excellent post-harvest handling, post-processing um, uh, practices, that you're focused on that from field to market. Um, be reliable. And this may mean being really honest about what you can't provide. To be reliable, you need to know what you can provide and not promise more than, than you're able to deliver. It's really important to buyers also that you show a level of commitment to their profitability, that you understand that they do have tight profit margins and that there might be certain things that you can sell to them and other things that it's just not going to work within this relationship. And in our interviews with buyers, it, it was really clear that it was really frustrating um, to buyers when they were asked to pay a 100% retail price without a discussion of um, sharing kind of profits across across the food chain or what we call the value chain and that they really needed to, to know that the growers that were trying to sell to them understood them as a market and what their needs were and were asking about that. Um, any way that you can provide convenience in terms of scheduling like your orders, your delivery times, making sure the paperwork that they need is provided. And, you know, ideas about this is understanding when does it work for the restaurant to get a delivery? What kind of paperwork can you include that works really well with their accounting system? Um, how do they like to order? We did not hear any consistency from buyers around how they like to order and from buyers and producers both. They said it could be that they like to phone call. It could be they like to text. It could be like they liked email. They wanted to go onto an online platform. So with that one, you just really need to talk to your buyer and find out what works for them. And then be consistent, especially in your communication. When you've developed that relationship, figure out what works in terms of following up and think about things like um, providing samples and what your guarantees are. So as I mentioned, really emphasizing quality and quantity. And so I've talked about harvest and, and post-harvest, but also food safety. You need to have a plan and you need to follow it. And this is becoming more and more of an issue in the marketplace. And this is because of some changing regulations at the federal level and also some food-borne uh, illnesses that have happened in the industry in the last five to, you know, probably about five to seven years. Um, one thing we suggest, regardless of what your product is, make sure that you have a 100% money-back guarantee with no questions asked. Be that confident in your product and um, let your buyer know that you have that confidence. And this also relates to your food safety plan because if you have a really good traceability system in your food safety plan and you get something returned to you, you're going to be able to figure out 
where was the breakdown in the quality of that product? Didn't happen on my side between the field to the market, or is that something that really they happened on that buyer side? Perhaps they they held the product too long, or it didn't get held at the right temperature. So those are things that you can figure out because you're going to want to know if product comes back where the problem was. It's also important to learn the minimum and maximum quantities that your market needs and that's really going to vary and, and so if you're planning on growing for a specific market then understanding how much they want at different times of the year will be really important for you in terms of your production and market planning. And it might be that there's some things that are really needed in a small amount and you might be able to provide those within the scale of your operation. So in terms of reliability, consistency, and convenience, again, don't promise what you can't deliver. Um, be consistent, quality, communication, timeliness. Keep that open dialogue and ask your customers, your buyers, what works best? And provide samples and bonus items. People really like samples and bonus items. And one thing that you might think about about doing if you want to be in a retail grocer, whether you have a meat product or you have a produce product or a value-added product, is offering to come into the store and do sampling, to be there, to be the face of that product. That's something that customers really like. It's something that the store could partner with you on to have a special day. And when you have uh, the producer in the store, when you provide samples, those products really move. That helps the customer pay that little bit more to have your local product and to choose that. And as I mentioned before, um, commitment to everybody's profitability is important. And restaurant and grocery margins are slim, and they really are being honest when they say they can't afford to pay retail prices. If they do pay the higher prices, they've got to be really particular because they can't outprice their customer base. And customers are price and quality sensitive. And there's a lot of comparison that happens on the grocery store shelf, and also when you're at a restaurant. I mean, if you go out and you pay more for this great great local meal, you want it to be really good and that's, you know, you, the quality of your product is really the foundation of that meal being sensational. And I mentioned value chains. The idea with a value chain is everyone receives a fair return on their investment. And with that, everybody has to understand, like Marcy said, what their costs are and what their price points are. And in creating value chains, sometimes there's the ability to create an intentional relationship where you are able to share some of that profit, where for local, your, your grocery store or your restaurant may say, you know, on these products, I know I'm gonna make a little, little bit less, but it's a commitment to my relationship to stay with them and buy as much as I can and really that's going to be based in the relationship with your buyer and making sure that you've had a clear conversation about why you have to charge the prices you do so that they know that they're valid and that you're working within their business model as well. So I wanted to throw out a few possible next steps for doing some primary research on your markets. So one is that you can really um, conduct your own market research. You know, reach out to the growers that are selling to different restaurants in your area or retailers, find out what their experience is, use the information I presented tonight to maybe um, create some questions, think about your entry points, and go out and, you know, talk to buyers at different restaurants and retailers retailers, you might need to contact them, provide a sample of your product, tell them that you would love to schedule a time to um, interview them or have a conversation about whether or not they'd be interested in buying your product and that you will follow up with them, let's say, in one week. And then you follow up with them in a week, ask how they liked your product, and then ask if you can schedule a time to meet with them. 
To know if you're going to make money in these markets, you really have to analyze and know your own price points. Um, know what it is that you can sell into these different markets. Some of the markets may have a price sheet that they can provide you and you'll know up front if things are going to work for you. Again, think about those seasonal specials where maybe if you can't meet an ongoing price point for something local, top of the season, best quality, they'd be willing to carry that product. As Marcy said, and I've been emphasizing, really look at building relationships with your buyers over time and be, you know, beginning to understand them and think what you can do in the future. And then what is it that you can produce for the, that market? And it may not be that you know your market research shows that this is the year for you, but maybe next fall you can come back to that market and specifically have made a plan of growing something that they need that you don't have this year. There's a number of resources that I've included on these slides that could help you with market assessment and business planning. These are some of the top resources that we share through our Cultivating Success program. And if you Google them online, you'll be able to find them. A nice thing about building a sustainable business is that it is a free resource, has many worksheets, and you can just download it from the web. Other resources that you can find that would be helpful if you wanted to sell into retail, sell to retail grocers or restaurants would be to visit familyfarm.org. They have a lot of information about post-harvest handling within this great resource called Wholesale Success and a lot of tips of working with wholesale buyers. And in this context, a retail grocery sale buyer or a restaurant buyer would be considered a wholesale buyer. And then Farm Commons has a lot of information about liability insurance in the event that your market asks for that. And it is definitely best practice to have liability insurance for your products. Um, what is it to have a contract? What does that mean? What would be in a good contract and why you would want to have one with your buyer? And ways to think about food safety and other things like labor on the farm. So with that, I want to pause and see if there's any other questions before we wrap up tonight's webinar. I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. Let's see. I'm not hearing Marcy, so I'm going to unlock and look at the questions myself and see if I so I don't see any more questions at this time so thank you for joining tonight and I would just want to go over and mention that we have a number of resources on the cultivating success site this is a picture of our site www.cultivatingsuccess.org and you can register for future webinars here but also under these resources tabs we are loading resources at all times all of our webinars are being recorded and you'll also be able to access them through the site next week's webinar is introduction to idaho farm link it's going to be next monday six o'clock pacific and seven o'clock mountain I see that's an error because we are now in daylight time. So it's Pacific daylight time, mountain daylight time. And Marcy and I are going to be the presenters for that webinar. At the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short, very short, mostly multiple choice or uh, one choice click on it survey. I'd really appreciate your taking that survey, letting me know how this went for you tonight and any suggestions for improvement. Again, if you had any trouble downloading the handouts from tonight's webinar, my email address is cdefelps at uidaho.edu. Be happy to email them to you. And then also my number in my office is 208-885-4003. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.